and the kingdom of darkness with light, and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ, to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The scripture says, And she will bring forth the Son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 21. We welcome you today to our study of the gospel of Matthew. In our New Testament series, Matthew begins by showing us about the majesty and the power of Jesus, the King of Kings. We hope you'll get your Bible handy and study together with us as we think about this wonderful start to the New Testament. We begin the Gospel of Matthew with the birth of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. But as we begin to think about the Gospel of Matthew, we want to set Matthew in its proper place in the New Testament to help us understand it a little better. The New Testament uniquely divides into four categories. We have what we know of as the Gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this first category, the Gospel accounts, tells us about who Jesus is, how He lived a perfect life, and ultimately how He died and was resurrected from the grave ever to live again. Then the second category in the New Testament is the book of Acts. Acts is the book that tells one what must I do to be saved or how to become a Christian. Then we've got Romans through Jude. That third category in the New Testament tells one now that you are a Christian, here's how to live faithfully to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then that final stanza or that fourth category is the book of Revelation. Revelation is unique in that it tells one how to die victoriously in Christ. And so a beautiful tying together of these four categories. But today, we think about that first category. And really, to understand Matthew in its proper place, we want to put it in the scope of the four accounts of the gospel. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, each of these is unique in that they maybe even portray a different aspect of the life of Jesus. For example, Mark is maybe one of the more concise and compact versions of the gospel, and Mark, believed to be written to the Romans, is a power-packed action gospel account in which Mark addresses the majesty of our Lord and Savior. Key verse to the Gospel of Mark is Mark 7 verse 37. Jesus has done all things well. His supreme majesty and power are outlined in Mark. In the Gospel of Luke, we have Jesus presented to the, the Greeks as the ideal perfect person. Luke chapter 2 verse number 52 says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Then the Gospel of John, kind of written to a generic audience, presents Jesus as divine or as deity. John 20, verse 30 and 31, Truly, many other signs Jesus did in the presence of His disciples, but these are written, that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and believing in Him you may have life through His name. But then, in view of Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew is unique as well. Matthew is a Jew writing to Jews about the king of the Jews, the greatest Jew to ever live, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. You know, sometimes in understanding a book, as we introduce Matthew, it helps us to maybe put some of the key ideas out for us to maybe grasp a hold of. For example, the key word or key words in the Gospel of Matthew would be words like kingdom. We hear the word kingdom some 55 times in the Gospel of Matthew. We hear the, the word kingdom of heaven another 32 times in this book. And then you see the word king 
throughout. Matthew is about the kingdom from heaven of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, of which Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, there's also a key phrase that is unique. If Matthew is going to convince the Jews that Jesus is the King of kings, Savior of the world, he's going to have to do that from their scriptures. That's why you'll hear throughout the book this phrase, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets. Multiple times throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew will cite something about Jesus, tell something about Jesus, and use an Old Testament prophecy to prove to the Jews how true this is. And so Matthew is a Jew writing to the Jews about the greatest Jew to ever live, Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And in Matthew 1 through 3, our text that we're studying today, we have Christ being born into the world, the birth of the King of kings and Lord of lords. What do we know about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? We know that He is of royal lineage. As we think about Christ, one of the things that Matthew is going to introduce is his royal bloodline and that it is from God and that he is destined from eternity to be the Savior of the world. Now, this idea of a royal bloodline may not mean a whole lot to me and you, but to the Jews it meant a great deal because they wanted proof from the Old Testament scriptures, proof that he is of the right bloodline to be the Messiah, that he's of the descendancy of David, that he has a right to the throne of David, and showing that will help them realize this Jesus truly is the Messiah. Now, what do we know about Jesus' lineage? The lineage of Christ stresses to the Jews that Jesus right has the right to the throne and all the promises given by God. I want you to notice Matthew chapter 1. Notice what the scripture says in verse number 1. Here's how the gospel of Matthew begins. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now notice where he starts. The son of David, the son of Abraham. He wants to show, Matthew wants to show from the outset that Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He has right to the throne and ultimately to be the Christ. You know, he begins by mentioning Christ in line with these two men to ultimately show the fulfillment of of promise. Genesis 49 10. The Messiah and the King of Kings was going to spring forth out of Judah, that great kingly tribe. And of course, our Lord. It's evident the Hebrew writer will say in Hebrews 7:14 that our Lord came from Judah. And so he is in line to be king. He wants these Jews to see not only is he connected to David. He's connected to Abraham. And you've got that, that great promise in Genesis 22, verse number 18, that God made the promise to Abraham that through his seed all nations would be blessed. Christ is ultimately the seed of Abraham, and he's the one who's going to bless all nations. And so he begins on a high note. He is the, the son of Abraham. You know, when you hear about Abraham, Abraham is probably up there with Moses, up there with David, one of the key figures in the Old Testament and one of the great heroes of the Jewish nation. And so we think about Abraham and we think about these things that Jesus is connected to. Abraham is identified in Scripture as the father of of the Jewish nation. He received that great promise. God said to Abraham in Genesis 12, I'm calling you out from your father, out from this nation. I'm going to make you a, a great nation. I'm going to build a great people through you. In you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. He received both the land promise and the seed promise blessing in Genesis 12. Now, the Jews had skewed that promise throughout history. But Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise being the son of Abraham. Secondly, he has that great promise blessing that we alluded to. Listen again 
to the promise of Genesis 22, verse number 18. Notice this verse. The Scripture says, God speaking to Abraham, In your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. That in Abraham, everybody, not just the Jews, all nations would be blessed. That, that promised blessing the Jews you know, held on to. We're seed of Abraham. We're children of Abraham. We're that blessed nation. What they failed to realize was that was to everybody. And that was through the seed, not seeds. Singular, as Paul will address in Genesis 3, verse 15 through 17, and to your seed, who is Christ. And then thirdly, as we think about Christ being the son of Abraham, there is a unique description given of Abraham that anyone be, would be proud to be connected to. The Bible says of Abraham in James 2 verse 23 that Abraham was the friend of God. What a wonderful description that is of Abraham's character. Father of the Jewish faith, the one who ultimately received the seed promise, the one who was known as the friend of God, and Jesus is described in Matthew 1.1 at the very beginning as the son of Abraham. But it's not just Abraham that Jesus is initially described as. He's also described as the son of David. Every Jew who would hear those words would naturally, it would naturally pique their interest and they would listen up because David was that great king of the Old Testament, that great king who brought peace, who brought prosperity, the one who ultimately would defeat their enemies and give Israel the greatest period of history they'd ever had. David is described as the greatest king ever in many ways. Acts 13 verse 22, he is that king of Israel that everyone looked up to. And yet, in Acts chapter 2, about verses 34, maybe verse 29 through about verse 35, David calls Christ Lord. And so we think of being the son of David, and what does that mean? Greatest king ever, and yet David paid homage, ultimately, to the Messiah who would come, who is Jesus Christ. Now, friend, it's also important for us to realize that Jesus is the promised Messiah who would come through the lineage of David. To every Jew who was familiar with the Old Testament Scriptures, he knew that the Messiah was going to come through David's bloodline. How do we know that? Notice the words, the promise made in the words of 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 and 13. Here's what the Scripture says. God said to David, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name. Now notice, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Here you've got that great promise. It was made to Abraham. Now it's made to David. Your seed's going to come. He's going to bless all nations. I'm going to establish his kingdom. His throne will be forever. Well, who is that? No doubt the Jews are looking forward to that day. They're in great duress. They're in great captivity under the Romans right now. They're looking in their mind. They're looking for physical and military freedom. Friend, that's not necessarily what Christ brought. He brought something so much better. Here's the fulfillment of that promise. Luke chapter 1, the promise is made to Mary in verse 32 and 33. He'll be great. He'll be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and of his kingdom. He'll rule over the house of Israel forever. Of his kingdom, there'll be no end. Now you think about that in view of 2 Samuel 7 verse 13. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Of his kingdom, there'll be no end. Jesus has the right to be the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the Son of Abraham. He's the Son of David, as every Jew is looking forward to. But then there's a little wrinkle in what the Jews might have been looking forward to. In Matthew chapter 1, not only do we have great names like Abraham, like David, like the great patriarchs of old, we have a couple of very unique people mentioned. Two women, actually, and two very unique women, Gentile lineage, 
both Rahab and Ruth are in the lineage of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now you remember the story of Rahab as God's people go in to conquer the nations. They go to Jericho and they come to this city that is, has great protection around it by the walls and the harlot Rahab. She helps the spies. She brings them in. She tells them how to, in essence, conquer the city, that she's going to help them. She puts that scarlet cord in her window and they save her and her family. And in saving her and her family, it finds its way into the lineage of Christ. Then the beautiful story of Ruth. During the dark time of the judges, a, a horrible time in Israel's history, there was a bright spot. And it was Naomi, and it was Ruth, and it would ultimately lead to the descendancy of David and bring Christ into the world. But you've got Ruth mentioned in the lineage of Christ. Now, how is this important? Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, greatest Jew to ever live, also had some Gentile lineage in his descendancy. These great women of faith mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, they were willing to follow God then, they were willing to submit to His will, and ultimately it stresses that anybody who will follow Christ can be saved from their sin. Now let's mention some things in Matthew 1 through 3 that help us to understand more about the birth of the King. In Matthew 1, verse 22 and 23, we are told that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be born of woman, Mary, and the Holy Spirit. Listen to these words. The Scripture says in Matthew 1, 22, So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. What scripture is that? Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. Virgin, going to bring forth a child. He's going to be God with us, ultimately going to save His people. Who was that? Christ, the incarnate God, Emmanuel. God with us is Jesus Christ. What a powerful, powerful teaching that is. Now, as we think more about the birth of Christ, we look in Matthew chapter 2 and... Really, there are four prophecies that are all fulfilled about the birth of Christ fulfilled from Scripture. Let me mention those. In Micah chapter 5, verse number 2, it was prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem of Ephratha. Matthew 2, verse 1, and verses 5 through 6, Jesus is born in Nazareth, uh, in the region of Bethlehem as well, we have those scriptures mentioned there as we see in Matthew 2, 1 and Matthew 2, verses 5 through 6, the exact birthplace that Jesus would be born, prophesied hundreds of years before in scripture, is exactly fulfilled in Matthew chapter 2. Another unique scripture. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, God said during the time of the minor prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Well, who's that about? We turn our attention to Matthew 2, verses 13 through 15. And because of the evil that Herod was doing, he, Christ had to be sent into Egypt to be protected from dying. And ultimately, when Herod died, God called his son out of Egypt. Again, exact fulfillment of prophecy concerning the birth of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, we have another dark scripture. We say dark because of the things that were going on at that time. In Jeremiah 31 verse 15, it was prophesied that Rachel would be weeping and lamenting for her children because of an ultimate demise of many of them. Again, tied into Matthew 2, verses 16 through 18, we have the slaughter of the innocents by Herod looking ultimately for the Savior. Of course, God had already sent him to Egypt to protect him. But here's another prophecy tied in directly to the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then we have one more mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Jesus, the Messiah, is going to be known as the branch or the Nazarene. And in Matthew 2, verse 23, He dwelt in Nazareth. He was known as a Nazarene in that way. And thus, these four scriptures, again, building up and buttressing the idea from the Jewish scripture 
that Jesus is the fulfillment of every prophecy that they had been looking for. And so we have so many things that are connected to the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let's make some practical application as well to these scriptures. As we think about the birth of Jesus, friend, please understand, Christians believe in the birth of Christ. We know He was born into the world, but we do not know when Christ was born. We do not know what month and day that it was, and more importantly, Christians are commanded to remember the Lord's death not His birth. If God wanted to do us to remember His birth, He would have told us the exact day, the exact month, and He would have commanded us to remember that. Scripture doesn't do that. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26, we're to remember His death until He comes. We do that by remembering the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Acts chapter 20 verse number 7. And so we want to clearly realize from Scripture that we don't know when Jesus is born. We don't know what day it was. It could be April. It could be October. It could be September. Whatever. We don't know what day it's on. We're not told. Listen carefully now. We're not told that it's December 25th. Nowhere in Scripture does the Bible reveal that Jesus was born on December 25th and Christians are told to remember His death. That's the event that we're looking forward to. And so, one of the things we learn from Scripture about the birth of Jesus is that it is the fulfillment of prophecy. As was seen in Scripture, the Jew cannot deny Jesus has fulfilled every one of those. As we then think about the third chapter of the book of Matthew, we're introduced to a unique figure. And that man is a great hero of the Bible, known as John the Immerser or John the Baptizer. And John preached a very urgent message. That message was a, a call to repentance. Listen to Matthew chapter 3, verse number 2. John was preaching in the wilderness saying, Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There, there's an urgency in John's message. His work was to prepare the way of the Messiah and to prepare the hearts of the people. And thus he preached, repent, uh, uh, urgency, get ready, the kingdom's coming. Acts 3 verse 19, repent and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. Jesus would later say in Luke 13 verse 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. But you know there's another important event in Matthew chapter 3 that John is also connected to, and that is the baptism of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Notice the words of Matthew 3 verse number 17. After Jesus' baptism, this is said, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus, of course, was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And yet, the voice of God at the conclusion of Christ's obedience, This, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Who most clearly and most uh, vividly identified Christ as the Messiah, God. His voice boomed from heaven. This is the Messiah. This is my son. Hear him. Now, friend, as we think about this text, Matthew 1 through 3, we have been introduced to Christ of royal lineage. We have been shown that his birth, is the fulfillment of the prophecies that were made in the Old Testament. And we've seen John, the great herald, stand up and cry, repent for the kingdom is at hand. And ultimately, God's voice identified at the baptism of Jesus, this is my son, hear ye him. Friend, we ask you today, have you heard the voice of God? Meaning, have you listened to what God said about His Son? Do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8 verse 24. Are you willing to repent like John said? Would you turn from sin and turn to God? 
Luke chapter 13, verse number 3. Would you be willing to confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Savior? Romans 10, verse 10 says, With the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. And like Christ, who was baptized to obey the will of God, would you be baptized to be saved? Peter said in Acts 2, verse 38, When they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. If you've never obeyed the gospel more than anything today, we're begging you, won't you become a Christian? Realize Jesus is the Messiah. Obey Him, and then you can have the hope of eternal life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.